he has started. That's coming up on October 11th, so two weeks from tonight. Um, it's going to be Dr. William Lipke, at the, he's a professor of the music department. He's going to give a talk called Music of the Reformation, 500 Years. So that actually, I think it would be very interesting. I guess it's, um, it's the 500 year anniversary of the, of the Reformation. We were just discussing what the Reformation was. Um, so he's going to come and talk to us about that on October 11th. Same place, same time. Um, and if you'd like... Before you leave, if you, um, I have a little listserv that I send out flyers to about the talks so a few days before the, each talk or about a week before each talk. If you'd like to be added to that, just see me after tonight's talk and I'll add to that little listserv. Okay, thank you so much. Without further ado, Dr. Simpson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, many of you may wonder why I'm even talking about field geology. Um, it's a lot of fun, isn't it? Can't you tell by the enthusiasm being shown here? Uh, actually, the real reason there's a lot of enthusiasm there is that that is um, on the way home during the middle of field camp for a couple of nights in a bed. Uh, and, you know, things like, you know, showers and company and uh, so on and so forth. So, but what I'd like to do today, though, is before I get too carried away, uh, I want to tell you, you know, thanks for coming tonight. I really appreciate it. Uh, I know that I have a you know, pretty good variety of students here, and I've seen most of you uh, before. And so I appreciate you coming out on a Seattle downpour to, uh, to see what we're, what's going on. So what do you think field geology is? Bob Kirkham, you are not allowed to answer. <laughs> what do you think it is? Throw some ideas out there. Field geology. Uh, okay, great. Uh, how is it different from other kinds of geology? Okay, so I'm hearing hands on. What else? Any other thoughts? Applications. Oh, okay. So the rock hurts instead of looking ugly in a picture. Is that, is that what you mean? Yeah, perhaps. I didn't bring my, my fake rocks tonight. Uh, mostly because I, I only do that when I'm really comfortable with the audience. I have a number of foam rocks that look like real rocks, and I often throw them at people in the audience. Uh, I threw it at a window one time, and people shrieked until it bounced off and <coughs> didn't do anything. All right, so a lot of times people think that geologists find things like this. It's a pretty cool looking skeleton, isn't it? It's Italian. <laughs> uh, it came out of the Po River. And yes, geologists do find things like that, a special, specialized subset called paleontologists. Uh, but how do they find them? Is it just from sheer luck? Well, I want you to look around this room and kind of visualize, you know, let's try and turn this into a synthetic outcrop. Is this row of seats? slumping down a little bit or sl sloping down? Okay. What about that table over behind me? Is it also tilting? How many degrees is that tilting below horizontal? The slope through here. You can look at this for a guideline. Oh, gosh. Always one in every crowd. Uh, that's all right. That's all right. Uh, because if, if it's exactly what I'm trying to get across. If this handrail is a bed, okay, and it matches this concrete floor going through here, and that table over there is the top of the same bed that was represented by this thing, what's happening here? Can you sort of visualize the events? And what if the river bottom that this guy died in is represented by the sediments underneath. And you find this particular beautiful skeleton in pieces on the ground uh, just below this horizon over here. Where are you going to find other ones? Where do you want to find other potential skeleta? Where would you go? Here's the bed. It's coming this way. It's sloping up like this. This one's over here. Where are you going to look for more? Can you project? to where the potential place is, where you might find the same locality. 
It's okay. It's okay. You can follow it right up and around. And so maybe we'd find some up by the snacks in this synthetic outcrop. See this bed over here with that table is coming down. We've got the mammoth over here. Goes this way. Hmm, maybe there are similar beds that other mammoths might have died in up on the other side. That's what field geology is all about. So, let's do some hands-on stuff. Um, could you imagine, you know, this nice, nice, nice area that we have, this nice sort of sloping thing. Can you imagine what it would look like in a textbook? How would you draw it out? Could you draw it out? I mean, you could probably sketch it in one way, shape, or form, right? Um, okay. These are some of the things we're going to wor uh, work on because hands-on is absolutely one of the most important things. All right, now, another important thing is I'm pleased to see that most everybody thought this was not church. They didn't sit in the back. We sat up more to the front. Don't be shy. Ask questions, okay? Please, if you so wish. Isn't that cool? It's okay. Don't lie. It looks gross, doesn't it? This is an early, early geologic map of Europe. Uh, this goes back to the uh, 1875, a guy named Dumont. Uh, here's another one that's much more modern. Good old North America. Isn't that pretty? Pretty gross. Geologists have no sense of color, do they? Uh, there's a reason for that, though. All these colors represent different ages. All right, we'll zoom in for a closer look. Here's the United States. Uh, equally gross looking, right, in terms of the colors. But now you can also see a little bit of topography through here. Um, you can see some very, very general divisions. You can see some general relationships to these shapes. Um, okay, great. Isn't that cool? Lots of different ages all around. This is an 1877 map of Colorado done by the Hayden Survey. That's also pretty gross. This is not the same, uh, this is not just Colorado. This is a combination of Colorado and New Mexico. And then here's one of the more recent ones. This is 1979 by a guy named Tweedo. Compilation of a lot of work. So, field geology. We go out and draw lines. We try and figure out where things are on the ground. We try and put together geological relationships. Now, sometimes when people look at these sorts of things, they think, why do you want to get a job doing what's already been done? I mean, isn't the whole state completely mapped out? I mean, it looks like it, right? Why would we want to do anything more? Any thoughts on that? Okay. Well, there are a lot of different things that might have gotten missed. Uh, I mean, how at the scale of this map, which I think is one to half a million, uh, one inch equals half a million feet, uh, the, how wide do you think a pencil line is? If you drew a pencil line across here, just say something was about half a millimeter in width, how wide would it actually be on the map to scale? See the roads in the valley down here? Okay, so that's a, essentially a map unit might be, uh, a pencil line might be the width of a highway or so, maybe wider. So you, you might miss a little stuff with all these lines. So I mean, there's a lot of work that can still be done. So how relevant are all these things? Are they relevant? Geologically speaking. Okay. Uh, do all those lines mean something? Of course, intuitively you think, yes, they do. The colors mean something. So if we want to find out about geology, do we just go out and buy a map? It's sometimes a good start. But field geology is one of those things where you actually go out and try and figure out more geological relationships. And you actually have to draw lines on maps. And you have to go out and try and understand what the geology is. Now, there are good reasons for that, and you'll see some of those coming up in a minute. Uh, so, 
This is probably the most important reason, and I've already heard it, thank you, Dr. Jones, uh, that field geology is when you can connect all that book learning to all the rock on the ground learning. That's really, really important. Because theory doesn't always work. So uh, very often, field geology could be referred to as mapping reality. That's one of the really neat things. Uh, if you get a whole bunch of geologists on an outcrop, they can't argue about the outcrop. I mean, the outcrop might be like an Oreo cookie. Brown, white, brown, white, brown, white. They might argue all day long about why it looks like that, but you can't argue the fact that it does look like that. The data are data. We might get more information as we look at things in more detail, but it's reality. It's right there. And that's what's so beautiful about a lot of the geology things in the world, is that it connects to something tangible, something real. So, on a practical point of view, uh, are these all things that relate to geology? You think? Is there anything up there that looks odd, maybe? Is there anything that kind of makes somebody look askance at it? Everybody buys the fact that this is all geologically related? You guys are an easy audience. This is great. I like this. Go ahead, Bob. You're dying to say something. Oh, you're not? Oh, okay. Just, just for clarification, Bob and I go back a long ways. Uh, he actually helped me get a job one summer. And I, I like publicly thanking you for that. <laughs> uh, but all of these things are really, really important. Now, field geology, I mean, you don't go out there and you find, oh, an earthquake line. It's not labeled on the ground. Uh, but finding faults, breaks in the rock can give us information about, well, maybe there could be an earthquake over on that side. Now, here's one that's a little more serious. That looks beautiful, doesn't it? This does not fall into tourism and culture, by the way. <laughs> Isn't that pretty? No. It's not? How come? Well, because a natural water source, you, it shouldn't be that color. It shouldn't be that color? I mean, it does not look like it could go out there and <sighs> taste great. No, it looks like it's an island. And its pH is ridiculous. Uh, oh. Very low. <laughs> uh, and where's it coming from? See these lines through here? Breaks in the surface. Okay, so if you know where all these things are and what the source of all this water could be, uh, it might help you figure out where there's a problem. It might help you with mitigation. It might help you understand uh, how to fix it. So that's a pretty good practical way of looking at things. All right, so the context of this whole thing called field geology, and why I'm going to talk about the field geology experience here, is that it's required by nearly all geology degrees around, a field geology experience. The best analogy I can make for that, uh, it's like get, being an MD. All MDs go through this thing called residency, don't they? Where they don't sleep for two years, and they learn, they run across a whole lot of different things and they rotate around to different areas and learn different skills. Uh, so that's analogous to what we do. Uh, this is the great buzzword that we're seeing now in higher ed all around, but it's always been like this, hands-on, it's always been inquiry-based and it's a high impact practice. And the other buzzword is this one, capstone. This is a culminating experience which kind of pulls it all together. So, what we do here is a course called Geology 495, it's field geology, it's four weeks long, and it's six credits. And I've occasionally gotten into arguments with people that say, well, how can you do six credits in four weeks? When you start crunching all the numbers, we actually exceed it by 50%. So we could actually do six credits in about a little more, a little less than three weeks with the amount of hours we put in. So uh, I, I sometimes have fun with that. Uh, so this, this is the track record we have in our class here. 
We've had about 100 students go through this course, a little more than 100 students since we started it in 2001. And we've had recently uh, a whole lot of people coming from all over the uh, country in Canada. Uh, we've had four students total from Canada in the last couple of years, which is kind of nice. What's really cool is we get all these flatlanders. Pardon me for all you guys who are from sea level. But they come up here and it's like, wow, look at these mountains. One of my biggest cleanup jobs is to get the nose smudges off the inside of the van windows. <laughs> <laughs> it's really neat. It's, 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 it's very re, uh, reinvigorating for me. So here's where we go. We start down in here in New Mexico. This is roughly where Bernalillo is. And this is coming all the way up into the San Luis Valley. And we pretty much cover an area all the way through here. And the reason we do that is because of something called the Rio Grande Rift, which comes roughly through here. Uh, it's a little a lot wider than that. But we see a lot of different features through here uh, that are very, very important for providing basic skill sets for geologic mapping. Okay, this is great, isn't it? This looks like something out of a textbook, doesn't it? If you took a geology class, and some of you are, and some of you have, uh, you could easily look at that and go, oh yeah, I've seen those in the field, haven't I? How do you think they came about coming up with these things? Did this guy Pearson just sort of say, well, I think it looks like that out there? Is this kind of a summary? Is this sort of a descriptive thing of some typical geology? Absolutely. Look at this one. Is this any better? Is it more confusing? That one's pretty straightforward. This one's, ooh, it's got a tilt in it. And it's got these different wiggles. And this thing's tilted through here. That's no fun. Now we got this thing. These are faults, breaks. Okay, this is a piece of cake, isn't it? That's a bit of a geological pun. Nice layer cake stratigraphy here. But there's clearly a break here, and this side on the left went down. Easy to look at in a book, right? Easy to figure out. This one's called a, uh, there's also a, uh, the same kind of fault, a normal fault, but it's got something weird going on. See these little sort of drag things here? It's almost like things got bent a little bit when it went down. These beds over here were a little bit flexible. And then you look at this one, things are different. Things got bent going in the other way. So these are cross sections, okay, like looking at a road cut. So if you were standing on top, all you would see was a line. It might be a little trickier to figure things out. So off into the field, it's clear as can be, right? Now, for most of you, I have to let you in on something. Some students who haven't taken field camp yet are here because they're hoping that I'm going to give them all the answers. <laughs> <laughs> it ain't happening, guys. <laughs> but you're going to see some areas that you're going to be going to. Uh, this is down in New Mexico. Uh, this is on the very southern end of our field area. Uh, for scale, you can see some students down there wondering what is going on. This is one of the first places they go, and you can see that there are all sorts of different pieces of geologic information through it. We've got different colors, got different layers, they're all dipping differently. Uh, they all might mean something. Does anybody have any idea down in this group with what's going on at this point? They might have some idea, but they don't have anything. They're starting to collect information to try and have a story unfold on their map. They're starting to draw lines. Now, it's kind of a funny joke in the geological world, which is, you know, we're kind of laughing at ourselves, but when you get a bachelor's degree in geology, you've learned how to color between the lines. Anybody identify with that? When you get a master's degree, you get to draw the lines. Pretty cool, huh? When you get a PhD, you get to choose the colors. <laughs> now, there's actually way more truth than that, you might imagine. Uh, that has to do with sophistication of you know, different kinds of geological features. But right now, these guys are learning how to color between the lines and figure out where the lines actually are. And here's an example of one. This student uh, has put down a lot of different stuff. They've drawn a cross section through here. See, I blocked out the names for you guys who were trying to get some inside information. Uh, and there's a lot of cool stuff on here. 
This is a representation of an area that they had to map. The outline is defined on a map. We'll see an example of one of those outlines in a minute. And this is their interpretation. These students walked out here. They drew faults on there, looking for offsets. They had some information. They drew lines, contacts between different rock units. Uh, they identified the rock units through here based on previous work and tried to figure it out. And they came up with their own story. And no, I'm not telling you where it is. <coughs> you guys. <laughs> uh, so what do you do with all this stuff? Well, this is, this is an example of a, a skill set application where these particular individuals have you know, done a lot more work. Uh, these are folks from the Arizona Geological Survey and the Society of Economic Geologists. And this pic particular picture was taken out of a structural geology book. Uh, they have lots of faults on here. They have different rock units. It's kind of an advanced version oops, of, uh, of this stuff. Okay, this is like beginner kinds of stuff. This is a little more advanced, much bigger area. Now, what's the application of this? Well, if you were looking for important geological features through here, uh, you might see repeats, or you might see other areas in which to look. Everything that you see underneath here, I mean, nobody's been there. There might be some drill holes and stuff. There's surface information up and through here uh, that you can map and so forth and describe. Everything down here is an interpretation based on what you see on the surface. Here's another example that's a little more uh, detailed. This is all hydrothermal alteration stuff. Okay, what's well fancy words, right? Uh, this is hot water, okay? Now you can imagine a hot spring. Does it cook rocks? Does it alter rocks? Does it cause different sorts of things to happen? Does it produce ore deposits? It can, it can. So recognizing these patterns can be very important. So in addition to just drawing lines between different rock types, these folks have also drawn areas of specific alteration. Now, if your ore deposit happens to hang out in sericitic and argillic alteration, where are you going to look? Out here? Probably not. You're going to spend your time up in this area trying to pick out more detail. Are you getting a sense for how even this just basic mapping of getting lines on the ground can, uh, can really help out with bigger applications later on? Sure can. So just to give you an idea of the amount of area that some of these folks have to cover when they're in class, um, you can't see it super well, but there are, yeah, here's one right here. These are 1,000 meter squares. And so this is a big area. They have to do everything within this line. They have to go out and map. They have to go out and look at stuff. They have to collect information. They have to bring a lot of water. Uh, and it's really, you know, a fantastic place. And there's another cool thing about this that you'll notice in some other things. Uh, there's a lot of tree cover, isn't there? Like none. Geologists love barren ground. Because it doesn't, all those trees don't get in the way of what you're trying to look at. So, Looking at things in detail, uh, here's an example of an igneous rock. Uh, you might find a body of rock like this somewhere and look at the mineralogy very carefully, try and figure out, okay, what might the sequence of uh, events be in this particular thing? Uh, in addition to igneous rocks, we often see a lot of uh, various kinds of uh, gypsum sorts of things. Gypsum has a very, very specific kind of a characteristic to it. It's an evaporite. Okay, it gives us environmental information. Uh, we can also find other things which are interesting in terms of gypsum and so forth. Uh, I deliberately left this note here because these are literally minutes apart. Different color snakes, fortunately. So I got a little bit of variety in my terror. Uh, but in another unit entirely, um, you know, there are other similar sorts of things. And by looking at mapping all these different rock units, you can start assembling a particular kind of, uh, you know, picture or some sort of sequence or some kind of story. You're starting to read the geologic record. Now, is this terrifying to young students? <laughs> what about the snake? Uh, we have an Olympian who recently graduated from here, and if you ever want to see somebody or actually confirm that somebody can jump 15 feet in the air, 
Uh, I can actually tell you who to talk to, and she will confirm that yes, she did, <laughs> uh, uh, without even thinking about it. Yeah, we actually we have quite a few snakes out there, but you know they're they're happy. You know this one's a little pissed, but uh, you know you, you hear them and you see them and you just scuffle about, and they generally leave you alone. Uh, you don't step on them or do anything silly like that. Uh, these are the ones that are really scary, though. You know why? Because they come out of nowhere when you're really close to the rocks, and it's like, Ugh. <laughs> but anyway, a lot of a lot of cool stuff out here. Now, I always put this one in because this goes back to an early day of when I was a geologist. This is in southeast Alaska. Uh, the reason I put it up here is that so ever since we've become the Adam State Grizzlies, I'm always amazed at how many people don't know what a grizzly looks like. So now you've seen one. Now you know what a grizzly looks like. Uh, this is about 35 feet away, and that's seaweed in the foreground, so that gives you an idea of my position on the ground. Now, where we stay when we're doing all this field work, uh, not in these beautiful sort of camps. Uh, this is the Hayden survey. Uh, they're all looking very happy, looking very scientific. Uh, I don't know, look at those tents, they got a heater. Gosh, what weenies. Um, but actually, this is more typical of where we stay. Uh, we stay in established campgrounds. Uh, this is a very interesting evening. Uh, this is where we were camped. Uh, and about one in the morning, I heard a lot of ruckus, and some Boy Scouts who were camped next to us were packing up in a big hurry. I said, why are you packing up? We're evacuating. Did you wake anybody else up? No. I uh, said, okay. So I got up and woke everybody else up, and I said, I have no idea what's going on. Just yank your tent stakes, throw everything in the back of the van, we'll go up the hill until we figure out what's going on. Well, 285 is right over here, and a culvert had plugged uh, down on this side on Chalk Creek and filled up with so much water there was a huge lake behind there and <laughs> went into a drainage culvert on the other side and flooded the whole campground. It was pretty exciting. Other things we have to pay attention to when we're out there are, you know, things like extreme environmental conditions. Uh, this is actually, you know, pretty typical. Um, you know, sun protection and so on and so forth. And another one of the fun things that we get to do uh, is we sometimes rub shoulders with other schools. Because we live here, okay? So we get used to having all this stuff. And when you, I remember a bunch of students came out from Bates College, which is way up in Maine. And they showed up and they wouldn't talk to us because they were from Bates College and we were in an state college vehicle. And they uh, wouldn't even talk to us, off they went. They looked like they had dressed for field work out of an REI catalog. They had all the fancy stuff. They had a little go-to packs, all those water bottles bobbing around in the back, and they had their little, you know, cool things on, and they were ready. And we were all looking like, you know, refugee Sherpas. Uh, we were a mess. You know, people, you know, people had two and three one-gallon jugs of water clanging around on their backs. I mean, we looked like bumps. Well, guess what? The next day, they looked like bumps, and they had a lot more sunscreen than they did the day before. <laughs> and they were only at 4,000 feet. Very little shade in these places, this is very typical. And often field conditions force you to do innovative things. Uh, this of course is a school van. Uh, they wanted more shade, so they pulled some seats out, they put a table in there, because we were getting thunderstorms too on and off. And you know what this is up here? That's a light table. Isn't that clever? So they just happily, you know, put their maps up there and then put their transfers over there and they're just drawing away. And there were people walking back and forth here every once in a while wondering, what are they doing? We're geologists. Oh, okay, and then they moved on. Other things that often happen when you're out in the field is, you know, trying to look at everything in the context of where it is. You know, we have these beautiful sedimentary rocks up and through here. Uh, these guys are baffled. They're just sitting there trying to figure stuff out. Now, the reason I know they're baffled is that I happened to come upon them. Uh, I came over this top edge up here, uh, and they didn't hear me coming. Uh, and they're like, geez. Uh, add a lot of expletives that I won't tell you. And then, why did Benson make us go expletive, expletive, <laughs> expletive up here? Uh, and then I said, well, because it's good for you. And they're like, oh! <laughs> and 
This gives you an idea of the steepness of some of that terrain in the area where they were working. Uh, they had a good time in some of these areas. They really sweated a lot. The views are absolutely stunning in some of these areas. Uh, this is one of the really nice things about doing field geology. You might you know, work your hiney off getting up into places, looking at the various details and so forth, and assembling the picture, but you get rewarded by fantastic views. Here's another example of a fantastic view. This is on top of a place called Ruby Mountain, uh, which is a real problem area. Uh, and it's not because it's a problem. It's that because students are supposed to be mapping some things there. This is also a garnet collecting locality. So do you understand the problem that I have here? We have a drone now in the department. What do you think we use the drone for? Mapping. It's actually, don't collect garnets. We're seeing you. We're watching you. <laughs> actually, we've never done that, but I want you guys to think that we might. So these are the collegiates. This is the Arkansas River Valley, and this is where we camp. Not a bad place for a classroom, huh? Now, another really nice thing that we get are just, I mean, the scope of this area is just amazing. I mean, here are the sangres over through here. This is the northern end of the San Luis Valley. This is a final exam mapping area. Isn't that great? It's the easiest test I give. I just draw a circle on a map. I have the key already made that I did myself. And OK, kids, see you in four days. It's not, well, I mean, I just don't abandon them for four days. But I mean, that's really all they get. They have to go out and collect their own geological maps. Make them, make them and collect all their own data. It's, 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 it's a really neat thing to see. Uh, so just for comparison, do you see the geologists? <laughs> okay, this is the same picture, only they're up here. <laughs> so it gives you an idea of the scale of this whole, this whole area. Isn't that neat? I mean, all this for college credit. Now, here's some students waving goodbye to their favorite field area. Um, this, this area is called Wellsville. It's actually affectionately known by another name that's similar. So I need to explain the, the byline that lured all of you in here. This is kind of dramatic, isn't it? I'm going to put some of my field camp alums on the spot. How many, is, I have you in here, Ashley. Is there anybody else in here who's been through the course? Oh, good, you have a bully pulpit. Nobody can, do, nobody can uh, counter, encounter whatever you say. Would you agree with this, Ashley? Are there any particular things that you would really agree with? Now, there's an interesting problem that I have every year. And I showed you some theory stuff, the kinds of things you might see in a textbook. And you might think that, oh, those are prereqs, courses like that, where you should have an idea of what the geology looks like. You should know what you're going to see. The problem is, is that not everybody thinks that way. So every year, about half the student body the graduates say things like, oh, this makes lectures make all the sense in the world. And then the other half says, I wish I'd seen this before lecture. You see the problem here? So really, that's one of the reasons why I try and mix up as much as I can pictures of reality and reality like field trips during class. And then if a student is really wanting to go out and take the course early, I will let them do that, even though they don't have necessarily lots and lots of geology coursework. But they will make a very informed decision. I guarantee that. I'm not going to just let them take it. Oh, uh, there's one other thing here. This rite of passage thing uh, 
is very, very real. Uh, whenever we go to national conferences and so forth, like the Geological Society of America, and they have student gatherings, I can't tell you how many times students walk up to me and either want to buy me a malted beverage uh, or something similar. And it's like, wow, that field geology experience was so cool. Thank you for letting us take it. And it's like, no, you're the ones who did all the work. You're the ones who achieved all this stuff. It's not me. I just took you to the right place and said, here, have fun. And they're like, wow, I didn't realize it would ever be like that. Uh, so this is very, very important. And if you think about the kinds of things that employers want today with out of college degrees, they want people who can think independently. They want people who can develop projects, carry them through, on and on. Admittedly, this is just geology, but those skill sets are transferable to other things. OK, so I'd like to finish off um, with just a couple of helpful quotes for field geologists. Um, I normally give this uh, to my, uh, like a closeout speech to my field geology guys, but I was, was una unable to this year, so you're going to get to see it. Um, what do you think of this one? You guys don't know who Thomas Edison is, right? Anybody identify with that? I'm still working on about a thousand ways to do things wrong. He was much better at it than I. I found out he's still touring. Did you know that? Isn't that great? What's this one refer to, do you think, in the context of field geology? Think about people just going out there. I basically give them the answer, and they have to come up with a question, so to speak. Is this about lifelong learners here? You're darn right. This is part of the rite of passage. This is a very famous naturalist. When did the guys these live? Do you remember, Bob? Was he 18th, 19th century? Uh, Agassiz? Yeah. No, I think he was more recent. Was he more recent? Because yeah. there's a lake named after him, yeah. which doesn't yeah. exist anymore. And there's a school named after him. Yeah. Yeah. I can't remember when he actually lived, though. Yeah, that's kind of what sticks in my mind, too, but I, I, can't, I can't pin it down. Isn't that great? Okay, well, there's better one. There are a few more here, which I think are better. I particularly like this one. This is my favorite part, though, right here, interdisciplinary. We, so we sort of joke about this in kind of a perverse way uh, about w our role in the sciences. The reason we sort of cynically say that geology is not taught in high schools very often is that the triumvirate of biology, physics, and chemistry is always taught because Geology uses those three and applies them in a very interdisciplinary sense, just like you know, all the cool things that we've been trying to do for the last 20 years. But when it comes to re reality of budgets, which one gets chopped off? Geology is the first one to go, even though it's one of the more in interdisciplinary ones that there is. Now, for all you guys who are chemists and biologists and physicists out there who are getting a little huffy at me, uh, what that really means is that geologists are jack-of-all-trades and masters of none. Does that, does that help a little bit? <laughs> we, we apply a lot of the stuff that other people develop. This one, unfortunately, is a little more tragic, given the, uh, the events that have happened in the last few weeks um, down south. How many people know that Darwin was a geologist, actually? He's not known for being a geologist, is he? But I like the good science of rock breaking. And I think this one is particularly important in this day and age. I think it's very, very important to remember the data are incredibly significant. We can monkey with our interpretations of data all day long, but we have to collect good data. 
And that's one of the things that field geologists try and do in their particular area. Okay, uh, thank you very much for coming this evening. I really appreciate you coming out and hearing what I have to say about field geology. Do uh, you guys have any questions? Go ahead, Adam. Showing a week here, a week there, or whatever during the, the four years in the classroom. What are mm -hmm. your thoughts on whether geology field camps might move in that direction and whether that's good or bad? I do not think it's a good way to go. Uh, my experience with talking to people about that actually came from the University of Washington's forestry school. They don't like, the people that I've talked to don't like the one week thing in different p places because they don't make the connections. It's not an immersion. Uh, a good analogy would be, uh, would you learn to speak German if you only spent a week in Berlin every other month? You might, uh, but wouldn't it be better just to spend the whole damn two months in Berlin? I mean, that's, that's one argument. Uh, the continuity is much better in a bigger course. Now, one of the ways that I've been able to really siphon off a lot of students from a business point of view from other schools uh, is we undercut them by about 40% in cost. And the course is jammed into, and it's not jammed like we're forcing things, but instead of having six weeks with weekends off and going horseback riding in the afternoons and stuff, we work 10 hours plus. When you start thinking about traveling to the field and coming back, and we do it all straight through. And even though the students think they get a day off, we'll go to Creed and look at mines. And you think you have a day off, but did you get a day off? No. Uh, we do it all in the beginning of the summer, so they have time to get on with life, get a job, get off to grad school, and still have a little bit of summer. And that seems to be pretty popular. And by the way, field camp for 2018 is already about half full. Other questions? Oh, did I answer your question enough, Adam? Good. Okay, good, thank you. Go ahead, Rob, and then I'll jump back. Uh-huh. Could you give us sort of a geological description of this at Bishop Rock? Well, it's volcanic. Okay. okay, does that help? Uh, a little bit more. A little bit more? <laughs> it came out of a volcano? Uh, Bob, correct me, uh, correct me if I misstate anything on this, because I'm not as familiar with that area as you might be. But it's volcanic. What unit is it from? It's the uh, Masonic Park. It is Masonic Park. Okay, so that's, that's a fairly widespread one. Is that, and that postdates uh, Fish Canyon, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. Fish Canyon is the huge one that has made this area so famous. Um, so what's the age? Is it 25? I think it's a little older than that, probably more like 27. 27 million years old? Yeah, much older than me. And then is there a connection between Bishop's Rock and Penitente Canyon, the rock formations out there? And that looks like volcanic, crest volcanic ash or something like that. Penitente is Fish Canyon tough, right? Because I'm always telling people that I better be right. Uh, no, but that's, that's an earlier one, and then this one's later. Now, there are all kinds of overlapping things. Like in the Colorado geology map, you saw a lot of pink stuff over in the San Juans, pink and orange. Those are all different successions of volcanics. They've been lumped together for the sake of simplicity. If you got onto a, much, uh, area, a map that covers a much smaller area, you'd see a lot more detail there. Yeah. Yes, sir. I could, but they'd be very short, because I don't know anything about them to speak of. Uh, but is that something you are you interested in? Okay, I mean that's, I'll keep an eye out for you know people who are willing to do that, and we might be able, to, if timing is right, we might be able to get them to do this. Mm -hmm. I think they're out here mostly in the summer, though, and I'm not sure they've been out the last few years. I'm talking about the people who've been looking at the Folsom and Clovis stuff out by the dunes. Is that the same one that you're thinking of? Yeah. Maybe we can, but I, I can't answer. Cool. And further geology of the valley? Have a talk about that. I don't have one built. I know someone who can. 
There might be a book coming out pretty soon that'll help. <laughs> Was that a good pitch? See, I'm not, I'm not looking at anybody. Uh, <laughs> no, seriously, uh, a number of faculty at Adams have um, just shipped a book off for review, which is uh, kind of the San Luis Valley. You know, they had the Western San Juans and the Eastern San Juans, and now one's being done for this area. And I don't know exactly when that's going to hit the presses, but uh, it's getting there anyway. So stay tuned. And we won't do book signings. <laughs> so Rob, yes, Marty. Is your closing picture um, one of your study sites from the next Yes. This is in the big area that I showed you. This is looking to the uh, northwest. This is Cabazon Peak up here. Uh, and this is in the White Mesa Bike area. Uh, you can sort of maybe see them through here, but there are bike trails along through there. There's a fantastic mountain biking area and geological mapping area. Oh, and those snakes were right down in here, by the way. Yeah, oh, two of them, the first two. All righty, anything else? Yes, Larry? Are you still doing snow camps every other year? No, I've been able to do them every year now. This will be my fourth consecutive year. Uh, and I have plenty of business. I turn away more people than I actually have in the class. And now I've gotten, it's like a gold rush when I open, up, open things up. <coughs> I mean, seriously, the, the site went live for registration on Monday, and I'm half full now. Now, of course, they're always, you know, coming and going on the, on the list, but for the most part, it stays pretty full. Usually, we're, by Thanksgiving, we're totally booked. Yes, Bob? Even if you want to. <laughs> no, seriously, I, 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 would, I have lifelong friends from field camp still. When did you, where did, where did you do field camp? When? Where? Uh, Black Hills and Rogers. Okay. So you had a whole different experience and a different set of geology. Yeah, it's a good time. Yes, Adam. Uh huh. Well, that same guy that, uh, and I'll, I'll speak in a very general sense, you may remember from that gaudy looking map of the U.S., where I sort of pointed out the western half, you could sort of see a change in the map. Uh, John McPhee, in Annals of the Ancient Earth, uh, describes the Tweedy pipe smoking geology of the East compared to the black leather jacket mirror shade geology of the West. And that is roughly what he's talking about, is that break. There's, I mean, there's, there's geology for sure out east. There's no question about it. Uh, it's ancient geology. Uh, it's different kinds of geology. But the really cool young stuff is all out here. And I mean, seriously, I mean, camps will drive all the way across the country to come out here because the exposures are better and there's more public land. I mean, on and on. So it's pretty cool. I don't know if that answers your question or not, but it's just like we just happen to be in the right place. And they have to come here. All righty, anything else? All righty, I think there's more food back there, so thank you very much. Thank you.